she said, Don, I had a vision last night. This dream that we would find a log that came out of the St. Helens explosions and had been gone down the rivers and was ended up at the ocean and was kind of salt cured. And if we got this log, we could bring it in as a marker, almost as a totem in, at the center itself. If we were able to take metal pieces and wrap them around this pole that indicated the life of a salmon from uh, the egg up to the final dance at the top of the pole. And in a way, she said, it's parallel as the way a student, that they come in almost as an egg and they leave as something that, that will go on to other, other places and doing other things. The way that she has become a teacher and mentor to others, I think, really speaks to where her values are. Without really knowing it, of course, I think she was a very strong mentor to me as we began to understand what Native American architecture was and realizing that it wasn't just a building, but every move made within that building had meaning and tell, told a story. I was born in Warm Springs, Oregon, the Warm Springs Indian Reservation in 1943. I must have been about four or five watching my elders beadwork. And my mother did beadwork, and then she made moccasins. So I just, it was always there. And my dad was very creative. He had a beautiful voice and just could sing. He was a tenor. Then he had a baseball team too. So the Indians and the white guys always fought. You know, they ended up fighting each other after every single game. It was no fun. I moved to Portland the day after high school graduation. I just had enough of the prejudice on, uh, and madras. She actually came to town as a beautician, and because she had such a bad back problem, she couldn't do that anymore, so she turned to art. That's what changed my life, touching clay. I just love touching it, feeling it, smelling it in all its stages, from moisture to dryness to fire. It just seemed to tie me to Mother Earth. This I don't want to ever let go of. And I thought, well, I found my way, but I don't know what to do with it. I said, I got to go talk to my elders. I went, went to Warm Springs and uh, I said, now, who am I? Who are my people and where are we from? They told me that we came from the Columbia River Gorge and we have lived there for thousands and thousands of years until the mid-1800s. The government moved the Washington people to Yakima and they moved the Oregon side to Warm Springs, and I thought that's where we were, we were always from. I said, I keep seeing this image. She had these big eyes, and she was huge, and, and I said, what, what does that mean? They said, her name is Shaglal, a she who watches and there was a story that went along with it. And I'm sitting there listening to all these, these beautiful words these elders were telling me. I just felt like I've been found. I found myself. When I did finally get to see She Who Watches, it was a profound sense of identity and strength that no one can take away from me ever. And, and that has carried me for 40 some years in this business. As agency architect for TriMet, I was involved with TriMet's public art program. 
We intentionally identified 10 stations, each one unique to the story of Portland. The North Portland Station was really identified as one that would be very important to tell the long story of the first peoples that here in the Portland region. Lillian Pitt responded to that call. One of the fantastic things that Lillian brought was the deep history of the region. She was so familiar with the Columbia River and the, the whole area. It brought us a sensibility that, um, quite frankly, I had never encountered before. In the sculpture that was done at the Ainsworth Pocket Park, one of the stories that Lillian had was She Who Watches, and that became one of the elements in that sculpture. I got to know Lillian a number of years ago because one of the main goals of the Friends of Fort Vancouver is to help reintroduce indigenous heritage to this historic site. So we have progressed from there and we have um, one of the largest collections of Lillian's work here at the site. I would say there is no line between the stories and Lillian's work. And that's probably why Lillian is just as excited about her artwork in a very non-egotistical way as anyone else, because there's the story right there in this little otter's face that emerged out of clay. It's as if it's the first time she's seen it, and so it's something that flows through Lillian. It is creation in many ways. You know, when I first moved uh, to Portland in the mid-1980s, one of the things that surprised me is I knew there were Native people here. But you drive up and down the streets, you don't see any Native art. It's like we were erased. And um, probably about three or four years ago, we started uh, doing more affordable housing development right here in this area near Nea. I wanted to make sure that these uh, buildings looked and felt native. So I wanted to make sure that when you drove down the street, it was going to be a native building. And the first person I thought of was Lillian. If you look at what she's doing, she's using modern techniques, but on very organic materials, basalt rocks, etchings, you know, engraving stones and images into these incredible pieces of just earth. One of the great gifts we have from Lillian is these monumental works of art. It reminds people that uh, Native people were here and we're still here. What Lillian does is she places herself in the current timeline, but as guardian of the past, but I also feel as a visionary for the future. Her art brings community together. And that will be Lillian's legacy, is bringing community together through her art. It's really true. Everywhere you see her art, it brings people together. You have to be resilient. You have to be flexible. And you have to be forgiving. From knowing all these wonderful people I've worked with in the past and who I'm working with now has just made me feel like I have a very blessed life. <laughs> <laughs>